Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to St. Andrews. I certainly <clears throat> enjoyed my week away from my study leave. Uh, that was very refreshing for me. Uh, this was at uh, Holy Family's Retreat Center over in Oxley. So it was very nice to be there and good to be back. And of course, the fall has come. And all your jobs now are to uh, think about Halloween, perhaps, and uh, raking up leaves is the, the next big thing on the agenda. Do stand, if you're able, and join in with our call to worship. King of all the earth, creator of the universe, from everlasting to everlasting, you are Lord. You are a rich stream of living waters, and we immerse ourselves in you. Happy are we when we walk in your ways, Lord. You bring forth fruit in due season and establish the work of our hands. Who is like our God, the one whose ways are just and merciful? This is our God, the Holy One. Come before him with thanksgiving and offer him our sacrifice of praise. I invite you to remain standing for our first hymn, and as it happens, today is Reformation Sunday. We're not going to sing Martin Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, because we sang that not so long ago. But this is still a good, solid hymn for this special day, The Church's One Foundation.
Almighty and loving God, we want to praise you from the very core of our being and with every part of our lives. We want to celebrate you, our God, with music and song. We acknowledge that there is nothing to be gained by putting our hope in powerful people. Their fallible and even their clever plans, plans crumble and fail. We put our trust and hope in you, the creator who made the land, the sky and the seas and everything within them. Your loving kindness endures forever. You work to bring about justice for those trampled by society and provide for those hungry for dignity, love, and self-worth. You break the shackles of those imprisoned by hopelessness, circumstance, or habit. You enable those who have lost their way in life to find you. You raise up those bent over by the burdens of life. You love those who walk in your ways and care for those separated from their home culture and loved ones. And you help those who are alone in the world. You, Lord God, reign forever, and we will praise your holy name. Gracious God, we also praise and thank you for the guidance that you give us from day to day in your written word and by your spirit. We thank you for choosing to dwell among us in Jesus Christ, and we praise you for calling us to be your faithful people. Bless this time of worship and of prayer, that those who need comfort may be comforted, and that all of us may become more aware of you and grow closer together as your children, as members of the body of Christ, our risen Lord, and in whose authority we pray. Amen. And let us continue with a prayer of confession. Almighty God, we confess that we've not always loved you with all of our being or placed you first in our lives. And we often struggle to love our neighbors as ourselves. We have failed to understand the spirit of the commandments and the way that was modeled by Jesus the Messiah. Forgive us for turning your law into burdens for others and for ourselves, instead of the way to love and freedom in yourself. Forgive us, heal us, and enable us to be the people you want us to be. We pray in the name of Christ, who has shown us the way and whose spirit leads us on. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. As the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, so does God remove our transgression from us. As a father who has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who honor him. For he knows how we are formed, and he remembers that we are frail. As we choose again this day to love God and to love one another, know that God has forgiven us. He has forgiven us all that is past and offers us a new and full life. Thanks be to God. Let us continue with our announcements. I invite you to take the bulletin home with you and to look in there for some details, I just want to highlight one or two things that are within them. First of all, um, there's an announcement there for a new Zoom Bible study on the book of Philippians. And so if you're interested in joining that new study, then please let me know. It says in the bulletin that we were hoping to begin this coming Wednesday, but I now have a funeral on Wednesday evening, and so... Uh, we are going to try and start that the following Wednesday, November the 4th. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. And if you're having troubles with Zoom, also kindly let me know. Um, just a, a, an announcement from Presbytery, as it were, and that is today St. James Chatham has its final worship service at 2.30 p.m., you may remember that Presbytery has approved the amalgamation of St. James Chatham with First Church Presbyterian within downtown Chatham, 
And so the final service uh, in the sanctuary of St. James happens this afternoon. And then next Sunday morning is the service of welcome in First Church. Now, if you uh, are like me and you turn over your calendar next Sunday, you will see that it's November the 1st, and you'll see that daylight savings has ended. So make sure that you re remember that before coming, leaving to church next Sunday morning. And I want to be, uh, express a big thanks to Spencer and to Jim and to Terry and others who've been involved in the technical aspects. We're hoping that we can do live stream from next Sunday. And uh, in the meantime, uh, it's good to have the uh, YouTube video services back online later today. And now I invite John to come and sing to us, Turn, Turn, Turn. Get test. <clears throat> Can you all hear that? All right. Yes. Doesn't sound. I don't have a monitor, so you're my monitor today. Thank you for that. So this is a song, as you, many of you know, probably from the birds, uh, but it was originally <laughs> adopted by uh, Keith Seeger in the book of Ecclesiastes writings, and it's about how the world and we turn. Okay, second to last one.
Thank you, John. Let us continue in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the way that you have inspired the writers of old, just like you've inspired the songwriters of today. And so we ask that as we listen to your written word from both the Old and the New Testament, that your spirit will open our hearts to the words that you want us to hear for today. Inspire us, we pray, and communicate afresh your message of hope and of peace and of love. Amen. I invite Valerie to come and read our scriptures to us. is taken from Leviticus 19, 1 and 2, and then 15 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The second reading is taken from Matthew uh, 22, 15 through 22, and then 34 through 40. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, you are trying to trap me. Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Here endeth the reading. Thank you, Valerie. Our next hymn for which we will remain seated is, O Jesus, I Have Promised.
We Canadians are watching the U.S. election with keen interest and bated breath. That's because the outcome of their election will impact upon our country in one way or another because we are one of America's largest trading partners. We can't help but be aware of the rapidly changing TV news cycles and hear the journalists take on events and their question is to politicians and to others. And we also can't help be aware of the moderators of town halls and debates and the, hear the kinds of questions that they ask. We're a little nervous of the outcome and given the polarized nature of America at the moment, the two sides are also anxious as to what the next few weeks will bring. That sense of tension, even anxiety, is also present in our gospel reading today. The events took place in Jerusalem, not long after the politically charged spectacle of Jesus riding to the city on a donkey, to the sounds of people shouting, Hosanna, which means save us, Jesus, save us. He then created a major stir by overturning the money changes temp tables in the temple forecourt and followed that up with some public miraculous healings. The chief priests and other religious leaders questioned him on the authority that he has to do those kinds of things. And he responds by three critical parables of judgment against them. And remember, it's Passover week, and that's a religious festival which, among other things, celebrates the nationhood of Israel. No wonder Pontius Pilate brought in the Roman troops to town to ensure that the peace was maintained. Religion and politics are an explosive mix, then and now. Just as there is verbal sparring between journalists and politicians today, this altercation between Jesus and the temple leaders was understood by everyone as the accepted means to establish one's authority. Jesus was evidently winning the day, and the Pharisees were very upset. And you can tell that they were rattled because they joined forces with people they despised, the Herodians, and together they tried to trick Jesus. Let's pause for a moment to remember that the Pharisees were an informal, self-appointed group and had been in existence for about 200 years. Some were wise, devout, holy men, and others seemed to have set themselves up as guardians of public morality for those in the public eye. And then they were, they were in effect, an influential, religiously conservative lobby group Contrast that with the Herodians, who were wealthy aristocrats and who were friends and retainers of Herod Antipas. And consequently, they were thought to have been willing to overtly compromise and collaborate with Roman authorities out of political expediency and self-interest. For the Pharisees to be collaborating with the Herodians was a sign of desperation. It's as if Jewish conservatives and the liberal wealthy elite were joining forces to entrap someone who might upset the status quo. So what happens? They begin with flattery, presumably to soften Jesus up before asking him their gotcha question. The question was political, but it was wrapped in religious language. Does it accord with the Torah to pay a tax to Caesar or not? Now, the Jewish people had major grievances about the question of Roman taxation. After all, those unpopular taxes supported the foreign military that was occupying their land. This question was therefore intended to put Jesus in an impossible situation. If he says that they should not pay the taxes, it would make him a rebel of Rome, 
and therefore treasonous. And if he says that the taxes should be paid, it would appear that he's on the side of the Herodians and so ruin any credibility he may have had of being a prophet. Jesus is not taken in by their flattery and not only recognizes them as hypocrites, but names them as such. He then says, show me a coin used to pay the tax. And Jesus knows that the, the tax in question can only be paid in Roman currency. And someone obliges him by taking a silver denarius from out of their own tunic. The coin had an image on one side of the reigning emperor. And on the other side, it had an inscription that said, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus Pontiflex Maximus, that is, the high priest of the cultic Roman religion. The Torah prohibits acknowledgement of any other gods and any graven images of, of any kind. And yet here in this most holy of place in Jerusalem, the temple, Jesus' adversaries promptly produce a coin that violates the dictates of their religion. Their complicity and hypocrisy are obvious. They're obviously happy to do business with Caesar's coins. And so Jesus then says to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. And perhaps we can hear a pause before he then adds, and to God, what is God's? Jesus had cleverly diffused the gotcha question and even turned the tables on them. And they are left in stunned amazement. Christians have often taken this response to define the relationship between God and political authorities. But that is not what this exchange is about. Even so, it does raise the question as to how compromised are we in claiming to speak on God's behalf while also cozily living with the values of our society, regardless of what political party is in power. Jesus is not saying that there is a secular realm and a separate religious realm, and equal respect must be paid to each. God always trumps Caesar. In fact, Jesus knew no distinction between politics and religion. The kingdom of God embraces all of life, and nor is Jesus saying, like many think today, that the religious part of our lives is private and the rest public. A little more on that in a moment. Giving back to God what is God's is the key point. But what does that mean? We have to figure that out for ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, since the time, the, the time of Tertullian, who was one of the late second century church fathers, interpreters have suggested that this saying implicitly refers to humans as God's coin, bearing his image. We belong to God as surely as Caesar's coins belong to Caesar, because we are made in God's image. We must therefore give back to God what is his, our very selves. Now the reasoning may be flawed, but the conclusion is, I think, correct. And we can't forget what Jesus said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. We can't live with divided loyalties, says Jesus. And that's also why our faith, or our belief system, if you like, is not simply private. It has implications for the way that we live our lives, both individually and collectively. Even so, 
I don't think Jesus is anti the state or against money or society as such. Rather, he is saying that God is Lord of all and therefore worthy of our exclusive loyalty, to which, ironically, the Pharisees would agree. Later on, after another trick question, a Jewish expert of the Torah tries to test Jesus with a further question. Which is the greatest commandment in the law, he asks. Jesus refuses to be nailed down to one command and responds to the question in his own way. Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is quoting from the Jewish Shema from Deuteronomy, which all devout Jews would say daily. And love your neighbor as yourself. That command comes from Leviticus, which we heard in our Old Testament reading. There is great depth and interrelation between those commands. We show our love for God by loving our neighbor. And that also applies to wearing masks. When we actively demonstrate our love to our neighbor, someone made in God's image, Matthew later tells us that God sees that as a sign of our love for God. See how theology and ethics are interwoven. Now that connection between those two commands is not unique to Jesus. Indeed, the rabbis provided similar summary statements of the law, and they served as proof of a rabbi's orthodoxy. We think, or we tend to think, that Jesus' reply is a hallmark of Christianity. Not at all. Jesus passed this litmus test and so silenced his critics because they could not fault his Jewish answer. But what is unique to Jesus is that for him, loving our neighbor includes our enemy. As he said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus radicalizes what that love command means. Giving back to God what is God means in practice to live by those two principles, loving God with all of who we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves. No one is saying precisely what this means in practice, but it's not a soppy sentimental love towards our neighbor or towards God. This kind of love is not easy, and it begins by reflecting on the extent of God's love for us. More on that topic on another occasion. One of the things that can be annoying about the questions of journalists to politicians is their apparent bias. They are hardly neutral news reporters, although some try harder than others to be so. <coughs> In a similar way, the Pharisees and the Herodians were openly partisan because they were public lobby groups with a vested interest in the, outed, the outcome of their grilling at Jesus. The thing is, we have biases too. Everyone does. But are we aware of our own prejudices and preferences? Theologian Stanley Howes writes, Christians are usually Herodians, but lack the means to recognize themselves as such. And what he means by that is that we have also compromised ourselves with the power structures of the world for our self-interest, and most of us don't recognize that fact. This lack of self-awareness makes it harder for us to give back to God what is God's. Let me give perhaps a trivial but pointed example. Many of us begin our prayers with, 
dear Lord Jesus, but fail to appreciate what the word Lord means. It's more than a title of respect. In the Greek, in the, in the New Testament, that word had both religious and political connotations. The Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures uses the word Lord as its translation for God's personal name, Yahweh. And that same Greek word was commonly used of the Roman Emperor. Consequently, using the word Lord with reference to Jesus is an issue of patriotism to the Romans and blasphemy to the Jews. So when we pray, dear Lord Jesus, what do we mean? Are we meaning that the risen Jesus is worthy of our worship and prime loyalty, or just our respect? If it's the latter, then we are really Herodians. And if it's the former, then let us authentically live by those two principles that Jesus stated, namely to love God with all of our being and to love our neighbor as ourselves. God has given himself to us. He's given himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. So let us give back to God what is God, our very selves. Amen. Let us pray. <coughs> Dear Lord Jesus Christ, help us to figure out what it means in practice to live today and to give to God what is God's. Help us to reflect on where our loyalties lie. And we acknowledge that when we reduce the basics down to just two commands or principles, we still find it very hard to keep them. Yet you did not intend for them to be a burden, but the source of true freedom. Help us to put you first in our lives and to worship you passionately with all of our being. And help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. You have placed us in families and in communities to share your love with others. Teach us to love and to care for the stranger in the way that you do. Lord, it's easier to love those who like us or who we like. Help us to love even our enemies and those who make life difficult for us. Reveal your loving self afresh to those who struggle with self-worth. Strengthen them to the core of their being and free them to see themselves as you see them, a forgiven, beloved child of God. And nurture and increase the fruit of your Holy Spirit within us, for those are essential qualities in loving our neighbors. Though there are prime ministers and presidents and rulers of all kinds, you, God, are the Lord of all life. It is in you that we live and move and have our being. We therefore pray for the needs of the world. And we pray especially for the coming elections in America, for what happens there influences the whole world. We pray for truth to prevail, not lies. We pray for victory, for love over hate and fear. And we thank you that in a democracy, people have the opportunity to choose their leaders. And we pray that people will choose wisely and that elected leaders will care for the things that you value. And they are summarized in loving one's neighbor as ourselves. We also pray for peace with justice in Nigeria and for an end to brutality there by those in power or in positions of public trust. We pray for truth and reconciliation so that civil order can return. God of love, heal the broken places of life and release those who feel in bondage. God of peace, quiet and reassure those in confusion 
and de or despair. And God of mercy, strengthen those who are weak or discouraged or are lacking hope or confidence. We continue to pray for those in need of your healing touch or a heightened sense of your gracious presence. We pray especially for Aggie, Graham, Roger, Angie, Bob Rogers, Roy, and for the men at the boarding house, especially Rob and Tim. We also pray for those who are sad at this time or who are grieving, including Deb and Dennis White and their extended family. So let's pray for them and others known to us in a moment of silence. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are ill or in hospital, give wisdom and insight to their doctors and nurses. Strengthen weakened bodies and restore broken minds. Comfort those who grieve with the assurance of your resurrection. And in all these situations, we ask that your spirit will work wonders of power, bringing healing and wholeness, courage, patience, and strength for each day. Generous God, pour out your Spirit on us today. May we be faithful to you as you are steadfastly faithful to us. May your kingdom come in all its fullness and come soon. Therefore, accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who has taught us to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please remain seated for our final hymn, which Matthew will play for us. Joyful, joyful, we adore you.
Thank you, Matthew. As you leave in a few moments, I ask that you uh, maintain your social distancing. There are the baskets at the back of the church if you wish to leave gifts. Be imitators of Jesus Christ as an example to all of the life of faith. To the world in which you live, live, give your love and service. And to God, give all that you are and all that you shall be. And may the glory of God's goodness be revealed to you. And may the grace and peace of Jesus Christ take root in you. And may the inspiration of the Holy Spirit empower you and fill you with joy. Amen.